We want to think about three different kinds of listening. The first one is informal. Now, this is just having a chat at the school gates or the classroom door or any other sort of informal interaction with parents. And usually this information, you know, the information that's going to come out of this is ad hoc and it's never codified. And actually, it's really important stuff. It's like the, the, the flesh on the skeleton. Um, that there's enough stuff there for a whole workshop in itself. Uh, we definitely don't have time to go through that one today, but that's a really interesting part of what we what we um, are looking forward to going through with you. The second one is formal, formal listening methods, and these are things. These are typical market research type things, such as focus groups, surveys, parent meetings, conferences, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where you have agreed objectives and, and, and premises, and the information is purposefully codified. The most common method of formal listening is probably the survey. Um, and that's what we're going to have a look at in some depth today. And the reason for concentrating on the survey is that it's probably the easiest thing for, for schools listening to, to take something away and make a significant change to what they're doing as a result of this workshop. Um, so we'll go through what makes a good survey, what makes a bad survey and tips on how to get it right. Um, and you can't, you know, because you can't really you can't deploy surveys too frequently and expect a good response, especially if your design is faulty. Um, the last one is passive listening, and this includes the use of observation, observation. So who turns up, who brings good energy, it includes use of data, who opens what, who clicks what, who passes what on. Um, and we'll look in that more detail again um, in a future workshop. Again, there's a whole there's a whole workshop there in itself. Um, so uh, we'll move on to getting surveys. So getting surveys right. So we're just going to spend a little bit of time looking at the subjects of surveys because they're, they're, they are very common. They're the most common listening, codified, formal listening method that schools use. So um, you, I think we've got a PDF of this that, that Pete's going to send around. So you don't need to sort of um, get too worried about exactly what's going on. So, so this C is survey must achieve its goal, which is the first thing. And we're going to have a look at this in a bit, a bit of depth, but this is the starting point. And if you get this wrong, you're going to fail. The survey won't work. At all. Um, the second thing that we, to succeed, it needs, secure, it needs to secure valid responses to the questions. And validity is important. And actually that comes from having a clear goal, okay? which again will become obvious uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment. Um, the third is to provide a, a picture that's comprehensive and accurate or is rich and insightful or both okay there's there's slight difference between those two things comprehensive and accurate or rich and insightful um, and lastly it needs to portray an org organization that's seeking information for sound reasons and then acting on that information and this is really about perceptions so a survey communicates to its audience by the questions it asks and the layout it uses. Now, a good survey can demonstrate an institution that's organised, efficient, in control, knows where it's going. So whilst we, especially schools, tend to think of a, a survey as a flow of information um, in, it's also an outflow of information. Um, and you, you need to be aware of that. Um, so let's look at failure. And it's sort of slightly the, you know, the other side of the coin. Um, screwing a low completion rate, and therefore you just don't get a large enough sample to make the, the data useful. Uh, gathering incomplete or invalid information. This obviously negates the whole point of the survey. Um, now, the rest of these points are, the, are about the, the information outflow to parents. So if you, if, you do a, if you do a survey that doesn't drive any organizational response, this leaves a quite a poor perception with parents in terms of wondering why on earth you did the survey in the first place. It's sort of, it's like an incompetency problem. Um, revealing ignorance or some other negative trait. You know, if you're asking questions about things that you really should know anyway, that's a problem. Um, sending unplanned or unwanted messages. There's lots of hidden information that by the questions you ask, you, you release um, doing a survey. And, and obviously that can lead to negative word of mouth with parents on WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so those are the, those are, those are the, good, and, the, the good and bad. So how do you get this right? Now, as I sort of mentioned a second ago, it starts with having a clear goal. Now, if you think that the goal of the survey is about collecting opinions or collecting information, you're wrong. That, that is not a goal of the survey. You don't have a proper goal. So your goal needs to be focused. Now, you can see, you can see on your screen that you, you know, it's, it's probably going to start with infinitive. 
with an infinitive. Um, I'll give you just two as an example. So let's say to explore, which is bottom right. So let's say, let's say the, the, the goal of the survey is to explore parental attitudes towards teaching of LGBT or sex education in school, whatever it might be. That's a goal. Um, let's take another one to measure top left. Um, so a goal of a survey might be to measure how satisfied parents are with the school's extracurricular offering or after school um, clubs. So once you've set your goal, it's possible to make some additional judgments that be crucial to how you design your survey. If your goal requires a complete response from all parents, you've got to focus on keeping the survey short and simple. Okay? Prioritise completion. For example, if you're asking parents whether they, their child is available for a school trip, you need, you're going to need close to 100% to be able to plan the trip properly. Um, so don't put this question in the middle of a bigger survey out of context, etc., etc. If your goal is to build a, a rich and nuanced picture about school life, you need more probing questions with more opportunities for wide ranging and open responses. So, for example, it might be a survey on student well-being and, um, you know, where you're trying to get a, a, a picture of uh, parental perceptions of how their children are coping with both with the, with the home life and school life and that balance. And even if you only get five to ten percent response rate, um, it can still be filled with insight and nuance and uh, in, you know, it can inspire decisions or a basis for discussion on initiatives, policies, etc. So, so there's a trade-off here between completion and richness. So, and you need to be very clear at the beginning about what it is you're trying to achieve. Do you need completeness or do you need richness? Once you've agreed your goal, it helps to expand that into a set of supporting and hopefully measurable objectives. Um, and at this stage, you should get a clear sense of direction and it's time to test the approach. And Pete's going to go through this now. Oh, thank you, Simon. Um, so one of the pieces of feedback we had last time is that going through real world examples is really helpful. Um, and yeah, we, we definitely think it's a better way of learning about subjects to sort of see it in, in practice. So some of the other um, factors about good survey design and, and deployment we'll look at now through the context of this uh, real world uh, survey. So what you're looking at there on that very sort of tall, thin green line is the survey. Um, it's 18 screens long. Uh, it's actually quite short. I, I think it's fair to say this is from a, a nursery setting, but um, I think the lessons that we can learn from this are uh, absolutely valid at any phase and actually in any context at all. Um, good things about this survey and, and in all of these instances we do there is a lot of good to be said this in this case it's a survey and the survey the fact that an, inst an institution or an organization is conducting a survey is in itself quite a good thing uh, usually um, this one was done in such a way that it was very easy to respond to it was uh, on a, using a technology platform a typed form which works really well on even pretty old devices so it's very inclusive in that sense um, we think that's good um, it was sent to parents about a month after the coronavirus shut down. So parents had been at home with their kids for that period. And um, uh, this would have been one of the first things that they'd heard from that nursery. And it stated that its goal was to collect information about parents and care of views uh, to help us plan future services. So quite a vague objective or goal um, but we also felt as though because it was quite short and it didn't take really that long to complete it seemed that completion was being prioritized there um, that said we did find some issues with this and we think seven areas that were le useful lessons for everyone in this workshop but also three of the areas that we thought are really quite critical and could jeopardize the success of the survey completely um, so Let's just look at some of those critical issues first. Um, so this is the opening screen of that survey. Um, it makes a commitment that we want to draw your attention to here. It says right up front, we will provide an opportunity for families to resubmit this survey every fortnight. Now, that's a laudable sentiment. And given that this is sent in the context of COVID-19, and also it would have been one of the first communications to be received by parents, you can understand why there's a desire to make a sort of confirmatory commitment of some sort to instill confidence and whatnot but from our perspective we would just say that sort of commitment is making a rod for your own back um, partly because it's a survey and you definitely don't really want to be issuing surveys every two weeks they are 
they're, they're time consuming for the institution, they're time consuming for the parents. Um, so it, it feels as though that was um, a slight error. Now it turns out this was actually never followed up. So it, 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 in, in an almost predictable way, that was an overpromise, and that lack of managing expectations is the critical issue here. Um, if you're going to, um, uh, if you want to keep a dynamic, um, updated set of information about the context of parents, which we can infer was actually the goal here, which wasn't stated in the in the email. Um, there are better ways of doing it. Um, and what we would say in the first instance is put that onus on the parents. Just tell them that you want to keep up to date with their circumstances and preferences and that they are welcome to keep in touch with you about those changes as they happen. Now, if you know there's a set of parents who don't engage very pro proactively, fine, have a different intervention for those parents. But you don't need to use a, an all parent communication to make that point. Um, so in a way, the issue here was one of um, mismanaging expectations, making a rod for your own back. It's a classic communications mistake in any sort of terms, um, but uh, one that was made here. The second issue here, now this is question two, bear in mind. So, so this is quite a bad place for uh, this issue to arise. Um, the issue here will jeopardize completion rates. This is a question about opinions. It's framed as asking for an opinion, but it's opinions about safety in a coronavirus pandemic. Is it, when is it safe or is it safe in your opinion to, for children to return to, to our setting? Now, the problem here is uh, actually a very classic problem for survey design. It offers yes and no choices and it doesn't offer a don't know choice. I mean, we can all look at that question and realise it's a very technical question. It's a public health issue. It's complex. Even though it's framed as being an opinion, there are a lot of parents who won't have an opinion on that or, or won't be comfortable sharing it. So not having a don't know option means those parents have nowhere to go and they're only at question two. And what happens when someone has nowhere to go in a survey is they probably just give up on it. And going back to the last workshop, it's a bit like a sort of a cognitive dissonance moment. You're being asked to do something, but you're also being confounded by the same thing. And you probably just give up, walk away. So this really jeopardizes completion. Um, that is a classic error. You must always have a don't know option in any multi-choice survey question for that particular reason. But there's also a second lesson here that we think might be potentially more profound. And this is one of the big lessons about survey design. So we think whenever you're designing a survey for every single question, you can challenge it by asking yourself these three questions. The first question is, is the person who's going to ask this question informed to be able to answer it? Now, in this particular example, the answer is probably no. The, 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 very few parents would feel sufficiently informed to say, yes, it's safe to send my kid back to your nursery. Um, but are they informed? If, if, the, the problem here is if they're not informed, you're giving them work to do. And that's definitely going to jeopardize completion. As soon as you give people an extra piece of uh, work or an extra, maybe them to spend more time on something, the drop off rates will be exponential. So, so the question is, are they informed? And if they're not informed, you really have to think carefully about whether or not to ask that question. The second question is, are they competent to answer this question? Now, again, in this instance, the answer is almost certainly no. Most questions, most parents are not competent to answer that question. And if, if they're not competent, what you get is a dangerous mix of on the one hand, overconfident speculation by some parents who just do feel confident about that sort of thing. Um, and on the other hand, that probably more common situation, which is where parents aren't confident about speculating about something like that, so they just drop out. So again, jeopardizing completion. And the third thing, which isn't quite so relevant here, but is often very, very important, is can we act on the answers we might get to this question? If you ask, ask and one of the questions we come up with later in a, in a moment, you'll see that if you ask a question and most parents are going to answer with one particular answer and you can't offer that, um, or, or even if a lot of parents are going to answer with that and you can't offer that, whatever the, the, the follows from that answer, um, it's a dangerous thing to do. You can cause a lot of dissent among the parents and not intentionally. If you are going to have to ask a question where you can't necessarily live up to what it might entail, you really should make sure you frame that very, very clearly, caveat that in the narrative around it. Um, and even then you'll almost certainly lead to disappointed parents. Now onto the third um, critical issue with this survey. So this was question four. Now, the way the question, the survey was set up was, was very, um, it seemed quite narrow, the scope um, of the survey. And yet here is a question that just says, are you able to work from home? Now, for many parents, the natural response to that is not yes or no, but is why are you asking? Why, why do you want to know that? Uh, 
the lesson here is that as soon as you've given the respondent to any survey pause to think about the motives that lie behind it you've essentially lost them you've either lost them because they might drop out or you've lost them because they might start thinking too hard about the answers and second guessing them and that gets to that point that Simon talked about about validity if if you realize that all of the respondents to a survey are effectively gaming the survey to gain some advantage then your answers aren't valid anymore and that's jeopardized the survey's success so here, the question is, arises about the motivation for asking that question. Why does the nursery need to know whether or not a parent can work from home? Um, we would say that this raises three other questions which should be um, posed by anyone designing a survey um, before it ever sees the light of day. The first question is, what should the scope be of this survey? What areas will it cover and what will it not cover? And if as you're then designing the survey, you test all, all the questions against that scope. If you find there are questions that fall naturally outside of the scope that you've introduced the survey with, either go back and rewrite the scope to prepare the respondents for that or change the question or drop the question. Um, also, this is a really good point about where you can raise the issue of sensitive questions. If there are questions that are sensitive or personal in their nature, it's, it's a good idea to let parents know that in advance so that they don't get stalled by those questions arising later in the survey. The second question is the purpose. Why are we doing this? Now that, at the end of the day, could be an expression of the goal and actually a really open and transparent survey could just express that in the preamble as this survey did um, although we think the goal was slightly wrong or it was excessively the scope was actually slightly wrong um, but if you're just clear about that up front it should keep you right um, when it comes to these questions if you if it was clear from the people who were designing the survey that this was about getting children back to nursery it might have occurred to them that asking a question about parents ability to work from home was not really um, focused on that goal and the third thing here is about consequences. It's not clear in this survey what, will, what, what happens with the information that's provided by parents. And if, as soon as you've given those parents the cause to think about the motivation behind the question, immediately they're starting to think, well, what happens if I answer one way or the other? And it's a natural thing for a parent to think about when they're responding to a school survey, but you've got to understand that it can then undermine the validity of the responses. So these three questions, if you ask those about your survey overall, it should prevent you from asking these sorts of questions which take the parent out of that space you want them to be in where they're providing with honest answers. Now we'll just briefly look at a few of the less critical issues, but learn just with valuable lessons. The first was this, this was the very first question, what's your children's full name? Um, the two, two points about this. The first one is that as soon as you ask for personal details, people realise that the consequences of answering a question are much more likely to be directly on them. So if um, you're asking questions about, that, you, if you want to gain the net opinions of all the parents about a certain issue or a certain topic, actually the ideal thing would be to ask those questions before you ask them for their personal details. And that's very commonly done in survey design. I mean, don't go too far, you know, don't trick, you're not trying to trick the people. You might state it up front, the first section here is about general opinions, the second section is about your children. If you do it like that, what you get is honest opinions and then answers that parents will think probably give their children the best um, chance of getting the outcomes that they want. Um, but in this case, they asked it right up front and it might colour the, the answers to the full set of questions. Um, oh, the second thing about that is just, if you're going to ask just for your record keeping for ease of you know, interrogating the data. If you've got three children, you probably want them to have three lines to put their different names in on. Um, it, it's a false economy to have one line in the survey for an assemblage of, of words. You'll find it hard to track that data. And the final um, one we wanted to look at was just one particular question, because there's a really good lesson here. This was a question about the um, pick up and drop off times um, for parents when the nursery reopened. Now, the thing that maybe occurs to the nursery is these are the times that work for us and therefore we should give parents the choice and that feels like a positive thing to do. But from a parent's perspective, they might look at that and just think, well, I don't understand for a start the difference between A and B. I mean, what, what difference does 8.30 to 3.30 or 9 to 3 make to me? You know, I, I'm having to work from home. Uh, I, you know, my, my job's gone all over the place. It's a really strange choice, that one. And I think without any further explanation there, this might lead, to, again, it's another moment where parents might start thinking, what's, what lies behind it? Um, and I can tell the nursery um, as a parent what most parents are going to do looking at these three options. They'll just go for option C because I think, well, I'll go for C because it gives me the most time and then I'll work back from that. I'll then tell them, well, I'll just come pick my kids up at four because that's what suits me. Whereas, you, you, you know, you might have the impression that if you go for A, you don't have that choice. But if you go for C, you do have that choice. So actually, most parents will probably go 
I can go for the same answer here, um, just because of the way they're set up. So it's a it's a sort of it's an obvious example of um, of an institution thinking purely from its own perspective and not really understanding the what the what it looks like from the parents' perspective. Um, in this instance, uh, uh, we'd probably suggest that they just don't bother asking this question of the parents. They just actually allocate times to parents and then deal with the consequences of that afterwards. Because we we doubt that this question would have given them any useful information to use. Um, after that. So just summarising all of that, so we think the survey sets up an excessively narrow scope and then asks some broader questions and that jeopardises its success. Um, the purpose is unclear, it's very unclear whether this is a consultation about we want to gauge opinion, it does look like that in places and then questions like this suddenly make you realise oh no this is a, if I answer C here does that mean I can't get A later, um, you know it's not, you're not sure whether it's a decision making tool. Um, and that point about consequences, if, if that um, purpose isn't clear, it suddenly makes you ask yourself all sorts of questions about consequences and it makes you un nervous about answering, which might jeopardise completion rates. 